So uh, today we're going to be covering a final set of things um, before we dive into uh, infectious disease modeling. Infectious disease modeling is going to bring us uh, to uh, expose us to nonlinear models, which have a very rich set of dynamics associated with us with them. Uh, today, though, we're just going to be um, finishing up uh, some discussion of, of linear models with first order delays and with um, in the context of, of uh, multi of nth order delays of, of aging chains and so on. Uh, we'll see some of the, uh, the dynamics associated with these. But first I'd like to go and dive into the exercise. So I had asked you um, as an exercise to build up a, a model which um, uh, offered uh, an extension uh, to this uh, to this to this model we had already built. Specifically, it asked you to create a and I should turn my screen sharing on here um, to create a model which has a stock of cumulative infectives um, or cumulative infections, I should say, uh, and then a hospitalized stock um, in the context of a situation where 5% of all infections are, are deemed to require hospitalization. And that determination is made at time when someone becomes infectious and someone who is infectious, uh, but is in hospital uh, has no risk of, of transmitting infection. So you folks uh, tried to work with this. Um, and uh, what did you, uh, how did you proceed? Can anyone tell me, how did you build a model that had cumulative infections? So when I started, I originally uh, created a stock that was linked directly to the, uh, to the infectious uh, stock. Okay. And I figured that would work. When I ran it, I noticed that I was getting up to like a 12 million uh, cumulative infections, which I knew just like wasn't possible, um, especially over like, I think I, I went up to like just over a year. And yeah. obviously with our population, that's not possible. Yes. Um, I ended up playing around with it. I, I tried adding flows and whatnot, and then people were redirected and then I was losing people. So that wasn't what I wanted. Um, and I eventually ended up with putting it connected to the flow of becoming infectious. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that okay, that's its okay. value was the value of infectious plus recovered. Uh, so then I, I assumed that like, as I was going through it, it obviously kept going up and up and up uh, while infectious ended up going down. So I assume that was at least more accurate than okay. what I first had. I, I, I welcome your, your working with this and there's some, um, some ideas in there that we'll build on. Um, so uh, great, I, I appreciate you coming forward and, and talking about those attempts. And I think those are probably emblematic of what a lot of people work struggled with. So uh, does anyone else want to advance an idea of how you might have uh, captured the cumulative number of infections that have occurred? Cumulative number of infections, because after all, when we, when we have, uh, uh, if we had this without looping around, we, we might say, well, the cumulative number of infections is the total population size minus the susceptible, because everyone starts susceptible, uh, except for one person. Um, so we might say population size minus susceptible minus one uh, for the number of infections that have occurred. But because we're getting this recycling, there's some people who've gotten infected twice and three times and four times around this. Um, uh, we don't know who they are, but, but because they could cycle around, um, that can be the case. So we can't just do population size minus susceptible um, because some people who are now unsusceptible will have already gotten infected. Um, so yes, uh, there was a hand up there um, and I'd welcome that. Was it Alex, is that right? There was a, a hand up just a moment ago. Someone had an idea. Oh yeah, hello. I have uh, something to say on the topic. Good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for this um, question of getting the cumulative infections, um, I went through the same sort of steps that Jeremy went through earlier, 
Um, but then to solve the issue, I used an independent flow and an independent stock. Yes. And then I linked the flow from to the infection flow. Bingo. Um, Bingo. Bingo. Um, okay, so so uh, you got it right. Um, so uh, yeah, the, and the the steps Jeremy went through are are you know good things to think through, but really what you're dealing with is is something like this. So um, here's cumulative infections, and uh, this is the flow into it, new infections. Um, and the new infections is just equal to this. Um, so the job of this stock in life is just to accumulate how many new infections there have been. This stock doesn't accumulate them because it accumulates them temporarily, but then they move on, right? Um, so you can't look to this stock to tell you how many have ever occurred. Um, it's kind of more a measure of how many have occurred really recently or what have you. Um, but um, if you create this, all of these guys, um, uh, this flow will be equal to this flow. And so as many go down here, we'll also go down here and they have nowhere to go. They just it's sit there. And so this will just rise, 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 even as this rises and falls. Alex, yes. Um, so when working with these graphs, if, mm -hmm. if I were to just do a link right from infection to cumulative, cumulative, uh, cumu cumulative infections, Mm -hmm. and just said um, cumulative infections um, increases, I think it was the derivative of the cumulative infections equaled the infection. That's true, yeah. So, so the derivative of this equals, equals this, uh, equals that, yeah, yeah. The derivative of this stock is that stock. The rate of change, for those who don't have a great intuition for derivative, what we're saying is the rate of change of this, how quickly it's going up is equal to this. So if there's five people per day going down here, the stock will be rising by five people per day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question on top of that, mm -hmm. should we always have a flow going into a stock? Because mine did not have the flow going into a stock. It was just a link from infection to cumulative infections. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it needs to go in. In fact, what you see is if you click on the stock, it's saying the rate of change of this, the derivative of this, it's right there, equals new infection. So that's, that's what a flow into a stock means. If you have just a single flow into the stock, it's saying the rate of change of this stock, the derivative of it per unit time, how quickly it's rising, uh, is just equal to the flow, flow into it. And if there's many flows into it, many flows out of it, it's the, the rate of change of the stock is equal to the sum of the flows in minus the sum of the flows out. Um, so if there's 10 people per day coming in and five people per day leaving, this stock will, will be rising by five people per day because it's 10 minus five. In this case, it's just like having 10 per day coming in. And so this will be, be integrating it. So yeah, this needs to go into this flow and then that flow will, will come into here. And you could see this is precisely saying the derivative of this stock, its rate of change is equal to this flow. And this flow is, is given by exactly the same value as that flow. So the job in life of this is to accumulate things. So if I ask you about this on the exam, you'll know if you see something like that, all it does is integrate up this. It just sums this up. Um, integration is a fancy sum over a continuous time, but it's, it's just totaling this up over time. It's accumulating it. It's, this is like water coming into your bathtub without a drain. The total amount of water that's come out of that faucet is going to be in your bathtub. Your bathtub, the amount of water in your bathtub is going to be the amount that came out of that faucet um, over time. Hopefully that's, that's helpful. So this is the elegant way to do it. Um, and uh, the unit of all these stocks is people. This is people of all the flows. It's people per unit time, say per day. Okay. So that was problem one. Any questions on that? Any confusions on that? Um, professor, yeah. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Couldn't you have um, taken, uh, like, I, I'm not really sure how the um, 
semantics of the flows work, but could you have put another flow from recovered to the cumulative case count, or would that have taken away from the flow going back to susceptible? Uh, you're saying if you had a flow from this to this? Yeah. Yeah, so there'd be two. So it's a good idea. I, I welcome the idea, but there's, there's two flies in the ointment, okay? First of all, it would take away, like people from here would either go here or they would go back to susceptible. And you don't want that because this is just, as we say, it's epiphenomenal. It's just kind of observing it. It's not modifying anything. This is not governing anything. It's not changing anything elsewhere. It's just accumulating. And, and you don't want it to kind of take away from these folks. These folks all go back to susceptible. So you don't want them to, to flow here. Yeah. Um, uh, and the second thing is it wouldn't be counting those who are in this stock or this stock or, or this stock, which I mean, it will be counting those in this stock only, but there's also these ones. These ones have gotten infected. And early on, very, you know, the first few days of the outbreak, uh, most people will be in here or here who have gotten infected. And those would be missed if you just had it go here. And third thing is actually, like while they're here, it should be counted too. It's not just after they've left there. So this, this takes all these into account. As soon as someone's gone down here, they come into this, okay? Um, so uh, they, they flow into this, uh, this state. Is that, is that clear? Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah. Um, so when you see something like this, you know, oh, it's just totaling up this. That's, that's what it means for it to flow into here. Um, and here there's no flow out, so it just stays there. It totals it up and keeps it, keeps it under wraps, okay? Um, okay. Great, so that's problem one. Let's go to problem two. Okay, um, problem two, well, I shouldn't show you my answer. <laughs> okay, how did, how did you folks do it? Yes, Jeremy, how did you do it? So we, we want a certain fraction of all infections to end up in the hospital and to not spread infection. They're in the hospital, they're not spreading infection. And then after some period of time, they make their way to the recovered stock. So what do we do? So uh, I created a flow from exposed to a new stock called hospitalized. Mm -hmm. um, there was the chance of hospitalization, which I had a 0 0.05, yep. um, which was connected to the, to the flow that was to the hospital. Okay. Uh, and then I had another flow that was to go from the hospitalized to recovered. And that had a variable that was the 14 days of staying in the hospital. That, that's awesome. And what was the formula? If the 14 days was the mean time in the hospitalized stock, what was the formula associated with that outflow from it to recovered? Uh, I had hospitalized uh, divided by mean hospital stay in days. Bingo. And it has to be. It, 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 dimensionally, it has to be because it's people per unit time. So it has to be divided by it, not multiplied by it. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it just has to be that way. Um, so that's awesome. There's just one final thing that needs to be fixed. Anyone? Uh, yes, Nastaran. Uh, we should uh, um, link the rate of hospitalized to uh, becoming infectious. And uh, okay, yes. I mean, this. This, this rate uh, sh uh, should uh, be a one minus this rate yeah. and then uh, time to the... Uh, Great. Uh, and another thing, we didn't... Uh, we, uh, it is not uh, uh, um, necessary to use mean latent time for this, uh, for becoming hospitalized. I mean, um, the uh, flu for hospitalized. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I... I asked you to simplify this. I asked you to just treat it as being hospitalized as if it occurs when they became infectious. In general, and for, for Omicron or for other COVID-19, there's actually gonna be several days between when they become infectious and between when they become hospitalized. And it's associated, it's associated with what's called an incubation period. And so that's a time before the symptoms occur. And then, moreover, there's a time between symptoms occur, like mild symptoms, 
and then when you really need have very serious symptoms. So actually, there's a delay in there, which I thought about asking you to put in, but I said it's too complicated for the students right now, one step at a time. So I just said, for simplicity, we'll assume that when they become infectious, this is actually the latent time is when they remain here. When they become infectious, they'll, they'll either immediately need hospitalization or not. But for COVID-19, there'd be actually a delay. It'd be like there's a pre-symptomatic infectious stage, and then there it's called pre-symptomatic, and then there'll be a, a stage where it's like early stage symptoms, which generally don't require hospitalization, and then you get into hospitalization. That's why hospitalization lags infection so much. It's like a 10-day lag or something between when you get infected and when you might need hospitalization for the most part, yeah. Okay, thank so you. yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so what I did is, and, and it sounds very similar. Um, so basically I said, look, um, there's some time that governs when you go on from exposed, but you can go on from exposed in two ways, one to the infectious stock and one to the hospitalized stock. Um, and for, Software engineering reasons, I said, look, I, I don't want to specify the, the formula twice of exposed divided by mean latent time. So I'll, I'll have a total becoming infectious, um, uh, what's called dynamic variable. Um, that's this guy. And, and I'll calculate exposed divided by, hey, come on, exposed divided by mean latent time here. Um, that's the total people who go on to one of these states. And then a certain fraction of them, 5%, just as Jeremy said, 0 0.05, times this go into hospitalized. Um, so it's this, this uh, uh, parameter times uh, this, uh, the total number that are going on uh, go here. And I should really put spaces here. Um, and, and then the number that go on here is one minus that times that. So if 95, so if 5% of them go here, 95% of them go here. If 50% were going here, it would be only 50% going here. Um, if, you know, 90% of them went this way, it would be only 10% of go this way. So that's what we do. And then just as Jeremy said, we have a hospital discharge, which is, uh, hospitalized divided by mean time in hospital. Um, so this is our hospital uh, stock. This is our stock of people who are hospitalized and they stay there on average 14 days. Rachel, you had a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering how come you aren't multiplying becoming infectious without hospitalization times 0 0.95. Like how come you did one minus instead of just multiplying it? Uh, because if I vary the assumption, so you're saying, why not just say 0 0.95, right? Is it, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the reason yeah. I expressed this symbolically was because I'm a software engineer and because I want to prevent bugs. And one of the uses of this model um, is you want to vary the assumptions about this. So I might want to have a different scenario, for example, which says, Suppose we had um, a fraction being hospitalized, instead of being 5%, be 10%. I want to, I want to vary this. And so I want to write formulas here, um, like for this flow, which instead of being 0 0.05 times becoming infectious and 0 0.95 times becoming infectious, uh, instead of having to go back and modify the whole model, when I want to make that assumption, I want to just be able to vary that assumption in these so-called scenarios, which in the job of these scenarios is to vary assumptions. So I could do here, copy this one. I right clicked on it. Maybe it's a mumble click on, on Max. And then um, you do paste and I click on baseline and I say, you know, um, um, greater, um, or elevated uh, lethality. Um, you could say more lethal or something like that. Um, 
uh, it's it's more more virulent. I shouldn't say lethality. What am I saying? Elevated virulence. Um, it's it's more virulent. Um, and uh, here the fraction being hospitalized would be ten percent. It'll be like double double that. And all I do is here I can change this parameter value, and it will mean that this flaw will now be 0.1 times being infectious, and this one will be one minus 0.1 or 0.9 times becoming infectious. So by avoiding hard coding it, I'm avoiding having to go modify the model manually uh, every time I run a new scenario. And that means less risk of error that I'll forget to change it back in the model. All my assumptions about a given scenario um, involving the parameters can be just abstracted out into these uh, scenarios. So all I knew is a different scenario. I can run it with this scenario or I could run it with that scenario and no mod model modification is needed. I don't know if that's helpful, but um, uh, I, generally I, I don't like magic numbers in my model. I don't like to put in a hard coded number because it's fragile and because the assumptions behind that num number are not clear. Um, sometimes I'll also avoid it because it logically depends. Like this one logically depends on the fraction being hospitalized. If, if, if I had a model where it just says 0.95, you know, it's easy to later forget two months from now, three months from now, it's easy to forget where did that come from? Like, wh where did that come from? The 0.95, what is it logically linked to? This actually makes the logical linkage clear. It's, oh, it it's, it's just one minus the fraction of infections being hospitalized. One of the big problems when we put numbers directly into our programs or into our models is we forget what's behind them. And so if we do, you know, control, uh, you know, we do find and replace to change the fraction being hospitalized from 0.05 to 0.1, um, we, we, we may see this 0.95 and it's not found to replace, but logically it depends on it. So by, by putting in a formula, this one minus it to represent, you know, what would be 0.95 when fraction of hospitalizations are being hospitalized, it makes, it makes the model much less brittle, much less fragile when I change my assumptions. Is, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, models are software. Um, and uh, if anyone uh, here has taken my software engineering class uh, 371, you'll recognize many of these themes coming through. By the way, tons of these models are built by mathematicians or people in business schools or people in industrial engineering departments or mechanical engineering departments, um, uh, even in colleges of medicine, et cetera, um, by, by epidemiologists, et cetera. And um, they're not trained in software engineering. And so they'll, they'll have none of these principles. They won't test their models. And often their models have lots of bugs in them, as I can vouch from peer reviewing them. Um, there, there's big problems in them. And we're computer scientists. We can, we can do better. We have this whole uh, set of best practices we can learn from. In, in software development, in particular agile software development to head off, sidestep, avoid a lot of problems um, that can be devil models and, um, and build models that are, are more agile, that can evolve more easily, uh, that are more transparent, that, that are less brittle, uh, et cetera. And it's fitting that we adhere to those uh, best practices. Um, uh, 371 is largely about those best practices, and we're seeing a direct reflection of that here. Okay, um, so we just saw that. Let's. Why, why would we build a model except to run it? Let's let's go run this model. Let's, let's, so this model is not just a theory of how hospitalization comes, you know, comes about here. It's not just describing a theory about you know processes in the world. It's a uh, precise enough theory, we can run it. We could see what the logical consequences of this are. I've been doing this sort of modeling for 30 years and, and I look at this and I can give a rough sense of what each of these is gonna do, but it's gonna be very, it's gonna be very rough. Um, what I really want is a, is a simulation, which will just run out the logical consequences of it. That's what a good thing for a computer to do. So I'm gonna run a, a baseline 
And uh, the baseline is going to involve uh, the standard assumptions, but now, now we're having hospitalized here. And so I'm gonna display hospitalized. Um, and for the good measure, I'm gonna display um, infectious too. I wanna make a point with this. So uh, you notice infectious is rising and as, as infections rise, they spread, right? Um, these folks going to the hospitalized state won't be spreading infection, but these ones will. And as infection spreads, um, uh, susceptibles are being drained here um, and it's rising and rising into hundreds of thousands. Meanwhile, hospitalized is rising here, but you'll notice that there's a limit to how much infection spreads. And, uh, and at some point it will turn around here and start its way down. Hospitalized will rise also and start its way down. But you'll notice that um, there's a bit of a difference in the peak. Um, whoa. Uh, so here are these two things side by side, and maybe it'll be best if I, if I put hospitalized below this one as it's arranged on the screen here. Um, so broadly speaking, they look very similar, don't they? So um, it kind of rises exponentially at first as one person infected becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, et cetera. Um, and the number of people being hospitalized also rises. It's smaller, but it, it rises. Um, and then they, it turns around. Uh, can anyone remind me from, from our last session, um, uh, why is it uh, that this, or for the last few classes, why is it this turn around, turns around, anyone? Why, why do you think that that turns around? If it's neither going up nor down, what would that indicate? Because maybe it's six. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Maybe because it's, well, I'd say, like, from what I can remember, it seeks stability. Ah, like okay. That. Okay. Yeah. And there's another voice, too. Yep. So that's part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make that more precise. There was another voice, too. I just said balance. Yeah, there's a balance going on. So, you know, at some point, the number of people coming in here, because infectious will go out, the bigger infectious is, the faster it will go out, the more recovery there'll be per unit time. So as, uh, as the number initially infectious is just to be rising, rising, rising very quickly, number going out will be very small, tons will be coming in because each infectious person can infect many. But eventually we'll reach a point where the number of new ones coming in is equal to the number of uh, ones going out per day as well. And um, at that point, uh, it will start to turn around. Recovery becomes more common. But you'll notice there's a difference in the timing of the peak. So this is infectious, number of infectious people up here. And you'll notice this little peak has reached at exactly time 30. Um, uh, but meanwhile, for hospitalizations, it's time a little bit later than 30. Um, it reaches its peak maybe at time 32 or something like that here. Anyone want to venture a guess? Why, why is that? There, there's good reasons in the world that's the case, because there's actually a delay, as Nastaran mentioned before, um, between when people become infectious and, and when they go to hospital. And it's, it's a delay of like, well, for Omicron, it might be about 10 days uh, uh, but between those times uh, for, um, uh, and, and, and uh, for, for um, regular, for other, other uh, variants of concern, it's a bit longer, maybe 12 days or so. Um, but why is it uh, that uh, right now, someone goes to hospital, at the same time, as soon as they become in infectious, they go either to the hospital or not. Why is it that it's a bit delayed? Anyone? At the meantime, uh, uh, for hospitalized is uh, bigger than the meantime of uh, infectious. Yes, yeah. So they remain in the hospital for a very long time. So um, for each person who comes in there, they're gonna remain there for two weeks here they only remain there for 10 days. And so they're gonna stay here 
quite a bit longer. And that's going to lead it to kind of accumulate more over a longer time before they start to leave. So it's not going to start plateauing till later. Um, so, so it's going to rise a bit further before it plateaus, before the outflow equals the inflow. Um, and uh, so the inflow has to drop even further because the outflow here is hospitalized divided by 14, whereas here it's divided by, by 10. So, so yeah, it's going to rise uh, a little bit, a bit further there. And that delay will be longer, something more like 10 days um, uh, for, for the case of, um, of COVID-19. Truth is, in our hospital system, the mean time in hospital for a non-ICU patient is about seven days here in Saskatchewan. For uh, an ICU patient, it's about 21 days. Um, so uh, I deliberately gave one that was a little bit longer here um, uh, for, for didactic reasons, just like I made these the same. Anyway, this is a little model that has, has hospitalized. Um, now, you might further start to think that, well, deaths overwhelmingly occur among hospitalized people. Or you could start to think, well, some of these hospitalized don't need ICU care and some do. But uh, this gives you, you know, some sense of dynamics. Now we could look at this case of elevated virulence. How did I do that again? I copied it and I went up here and I pasted it. And then I went, I, I went down and I named it elevated virulence and I, I went down and I frobbed this setting, the fraction of infections being hospitalized to 0.1. You notice it's emboldened to indicate, hey, it's changed from the default value. Great. So let's go run that one. Let's go see what, uh, what happens. Um, so we're going to, to run this. And what we'll see is now it's, it's quite, a bit, uh, quite a bit larger. Um, so uh, it's going to rise and it's going to reach a, a value again when well into the tens of thousands. And now it reaches a value in the like maybe 77,000 or something like that, which is considerably higher. I should have noted the value at the peak before, but this is considerably higher than it. And it's going to drag down. And you notice that it drags down comparatively long compared to this rapid rise. This rise is driven by what? What's this rapid doubling driven by? Anyone? I said it earlier, but you can repeat the basic gist of it to me now. What is this, what is this rapidness of this rise driven by? It's the exponential infections. It's right? the exponential infections. One infection breeds another, breeds another. And as we'll see, it'll be particularly through this probability of transmission in these mean contacts here. Um, uh, if those are larger, either of these, it'll rise even faster. So for Omicron, like um, uh, effectively, it could reach more mean contacts per day, and it's extremely transmissible, and this, this was higher. It can bind more closely to certain receptors in the lungs, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, OK, but you'll notice this fall, what does this do to um, the, the sort of the, the rate at which this falls down, what do you think that's due to? I would imagine that's due to, um, it, it's due to how long they're staying in the hospital, right? So that's you right. Have it, it, and it's with the infection. So you get 100 people in and then you get 200 people in. Yep. So those people, the first 100 are going to be out quicker. And then the, the ones after that, you know, they're delayed by a day. And then the double after that's delayed by a day. Exactly. Yes. So you have a very good sense of it. So if you look at infectious people, um, you'll notice that uh, like by time 60, the peak occurs just after 30. By time 60, this is quite a lot lower for, for infectious. But for a hospital, it takes, it takes longer. By time 60, it doesn't come down proportionally nearly as much. Um, it's quite a bit higher. It's, it's, given, it's dictated by this mean time in hospital. And so that will sort of keep people there for a while. And if you're dealing with an ICU where if you come in, you're going to occupy that bed for three weeks if you're lucky and you don't die, you're going to occupy that bed for three weeks. Um, you know, those beds go pretty quick. You have 129 beds in the, in the, in the province. You know, they, they go out pretty quick because one person occupies it for three weeks. Um, then, 
you know, this is going to actually last. That, that ICU population is going to drain slowly. The hospital population is going to drain, drain, drain slowly compared to the number of infectious as well. Um, so anyway, that's a, a bit of the dynamics and a bit of the current situation as well. Um, I think that's um, all we'll, we'll, we'll go through for uh, that exercise. But are there any questions on the exercise? Any further questions on that? OK, I hope this is useful to struggle with it. Let's go on to some new material um, to, to finish out the discussion of first order and nth order delays. Now, um, I think I'll stop this recording. <laughs>